Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited and grateful to be talking about peace and justice activism. We have Jody Evans joining us on the show. Hello. Hello, thanks, Tan. Thank you so much for coming on. Really <laughs> appreciate it. And we're really excited to talk to Jody. Jody has a massive background in peace and justice activism. She is the co-founder of Code Pink. She has been doing this how many years now? Two decades? Well, activism I've been doing for 47 years. Okay, 40, four, and a half, oh, four and a half decades of activism. Yeah. That's crazy. Code, Code Pink, Pink, we're in our 16th year. 16th year. But wow. we didn't ever want to start an organization. I mean, Code Pink was a response to Bush's lies that were, you know, taking us to war. And he used the terrorist codes, red, orange, and yellow, to frighten the American people. So we called Code Pink for Peace, clearly knowing that the idea of going to war in Iraq was so stupid it would never happen. And um, so we tried to stop that war. We had to continue because threats of more wars continued. And now we're in six. We've got three hot spots. Um, and the work continues. The work does continue. There is a massive war economy. There's a massive military industrial complex. There's a massive amount of humans that we've raised as seeds without the proper nutrients and water of this sincere self work and this inner development. Oh, no, no, no. We've literally raised them on militarism. I mean, that's the seeds that have been planted. They had seeds, they just weren't seeds of peace. And across the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm just a day out of Iran. So, um, there are places in the world that are not raised on militarism, that are raised on love and the value of peace. So yeah. that is true. And I want to say that I, last night, walking around in your neighborhood at 10.30 at night, I cried for about 25 minutes coming from Iran, a place of generosity and caring and a real deep understanding of peace, you know, one that probably came out of having a war that killed a million people. Um, but to walk the streets of the Tenderloin of San Francisco and see the number of people thrown away um, was really disturbing. And massive war economy. So, you know, after being in Code Pink and all the work we were doing to end war, I realized, oh, we're not going to end war till we end the war economy because war is just serving the war economy and it's doing a very good job of it. So trying to be an anti-war activist while we live inside a war economy, which is basically our culture, um, is a tough thing. So I looked at it like, okay, so there's this war economy which is killing us, our communities, and the planet. And if we look at that mythologically, because every you know, culture has like this flood, flood mythology, so say it was our flood, what would the ark be that we would build? And out of that came growing a local peace economy. The peace economy. Because yeah. the war economy is the extractive, destructive, you know, oppressive economy. But there's this other economy. It's the giving, sharing, caring, thriving, relational, resilient economy without which none of us would be alive. But we all think we get life from the war economy. We all like give all of ourselves to this war economy when literally we are alive because of the peace economy, because of the way we take care of each other, how we're parented. Yeah. You know, the things that really nurture life yeah. are the things in the peace economy. But we've been seduced. Uh, to thinking it's this other economy and we give our time and our money and our effort and we play the game of the war economy which thrives on alienation and separation and making us believe that we live in scarcity instead of abundance. So um, I feel like I just came from a country that lives much closer to the peace economy than we do here. And they're a country that hasn't been waging war on other countries. They've been attacked and they've been threatened. Um, what was really interesting is we went there to try to get stories about the effects of US sanctions on the people. And um, it was so nice to have like a fresh, really human reaction to Trump sanctions. And this is a country that loves Americans. I mean, I've been all over the world. This is kind of baffling how much Iranians love Americans, but they hate Trump. 
and they feel so messed with um, because for three years, here's a country that was, their foreign minister said, okay, we're going to do negotiations with the U.S., even though everybody knows the U.S. is horrible at negotiations and doesn't ever get to peace. But he did it, and Kerry, and he showed up, and they came to a peace accord that everybody was for. And then Trump wins, and he rips it up. And do you know that all those Iranian people felt that personally? And it's so nice to be in a country that actually hasn't been numbed to not feeling when you're in the midst, when you're at the effects of violence, because there's so much violence in our culture we don't even recognize it. Yeah, there are lots of hidden <laughs> structural violences that are impeding humans from full self-actualization, full peace activization all across the planet. You're hinting at this interesting thing that is happening around the world, which is where there are little pockets of peace that are occurring uh, around the world. Peace is, is flourishing in certain areas, and the war economy can sometimes come into those areas and cause it to dismantle that peace mm -hmm. for resource extraction or for whatever the the, the desire to do a, a power change. Um, there's a lot of different reasons. But Code Pink does something interesting which you just started speaking towards, which is you go on these, on these, um, these citizen diplomacy missions. And it's cool how when you go to a place like Iran and then you start, you start actually surrounding yourself with more and more. We get blessed occasionally. We get to surround ourselves in a place like San Francisco or New York. These places are very uh, cosmopolitan already. They're really melting pot. So we get to stumble across um, people that are um, from Iran or South Korea or wherever they may be from. And so we're already getting at least a little taste. But when you go all the way into the culture, you get an even deeper taste. Well, you get the culture. You get actually. the actual culture. Yeah. More so, more of it. And so when when you're there, it's cool how when you go on these citizen diplomacy missions, you're you're actually speaking to um, um, political figures there. You're speaking to. You're going to museums. You're going into the the cultural settings. You're learning from from the people there, and you're you're making those dire connections across the planet that we so need for the peace economy. Well, I think even more. Um, you bring back the relationships. So, and you also kind of break through the mystery. Walking from North Korea to South Korea across the DMZ, I, I can see that almost every trip that we have taken from Code Pink, people are like scared about where we're going. They're like super worried about us because the stories that are fed to us in our media make us frightened of the other, right? It's like, oh, they're the boogeyman in some form. Uh, I remember the first time before we invaded Iraq, we went to Iraq and people were really frightened for our lives. but. Iraq is a country of beautiful, kind, generous, loving people. And we had an amazing time. But what we were able to bring back is the truth about what was happening in Iraq instead of the boogeyman story. And I would say that that's the truth, you know, that's what happened with North Korea. To spend a week in North Korea when literally every media, everything is just like, oh my God, you're supporting, you know, like you can't go because everybody's going to throw mud at you. But if you just go, with your intention of connecting with people and bringing back stories and actually just kind of breaking through the membrane and then walking across the DMZ for the first time in 70 years, well, you have to believe that that membrane breaking that Christine on led has led to what's happening as in peace talks. And even though they kind of look like they broke down, that's what peace talks look like. That's what diplomacy looks like. It looks like you sit at a table and you kind of learn what you're going to need and then you fight and you pivot and you posture. I mean, when we were in Iran, we um, met with Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran. And he talked about the difficulty of the what, what's happening in Iran now and that he'd lost the confidence of the people, that he'd convinced them that diplomacy would work, but then Trump had ripped up the peace cord and they're like, no, we need to like stand up. We need to like not back down. We, you know, this isn't okay. And so he'd lost the confidence of the people. So after our meeting, he resigned and it was a big deal. And then he gets Whoa. invited back 
and now he has another level of confidence because people realize, well, you can beat up the guy, but then he's the guy really leading you to what you want because you really don't want war. You really don't want to, you know, kick America back in the teeth like you're feeling kicked in the teeth. And it was a really interesting process to go through of like we're a peace process is a long process and it's not easy and it's why, why war happens because it's super easy in the beginning. But like look how much money we've spent on Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya. You know, it's a crazy amount of money, but it's also the violation of the planet. The, I mean, what it is to the troops, every 22 seconds or something, 22 minutes, a, another veteran is committing suicide. Mm -hmm. um, it militarizes our, our culture and our economy. So we don't look at the costs. We just look at that immediate, like, oh, we're gonna you know, bomb our way, we're gonna control our way into what we want, which never happens. And so watching both Korea and Iran are really beautiful experiences because they are a possibility of peace. War is the, you know, no possibility of peace. We've gotten this far because of cooperation and communication with each other in many ways and, I th and extending that into the current geopolitical sphere is incredibly important and it's paramount and one of the difficulties that we see is that we have eight billion of us and it's causing a lot of geopolitical complexity mm -hmm. and when there there's this weird thing of people want democratic elections people want to see people that are in power for periods of time actually step down after they lose an election and the, and in and many times we see them rather than step down we see them doing things like publicly executing people that are dissidents of their campaigns. We see these, so, so how do you balance wanting to assist in a country's democratic process with an authoritarian dictator rising in that country? I, I don't even try because I don't live there. So what I try to do is affect the country I live inside of, which is the greatest terrorists on the planet and do, we do the most damage and we have the biggest military budget and we the imperialism of the US forces violence around the world I can't begin to have the hubris that I'm gonna tell another country what to do when my own country that I'm a citizen of is already so violent that's enough for me to deal with <laughs> well maybe we don't use the word tell right but maybe we use the word assist because I just a, try to expose to the American people what they're doing, what sanctions do to people in Iran, what sanctions do to people in Venezuela, what sanctions do to people in Cuba and Iraq, and you know what our manipulating does to people in Africa, and you know like how we pretend to give money to Africans then steal all this other money, um, how we claim that other countries are corrupt when the corruption in America, nothing matches. The fact that Apple, Amazon, Walmart do not pay taxes, a level of corruption that is allowed, and we pretend like it's legal. But it's, it, it may be legal, but it's violent. And it's destructive. I mean, it's literally money being siphoned out of the lives of millions and millions and millions of workers and not put back into those communities. That's the same thing as corruption and all these other countries where it's like, oh, they're so corrupt and we gotta go in and like save them or whatever. Like, I'm not into, and first of all, how do you have democracy on a planet when there is really just oligarchy? When the power has been given to too few people, it's too much power, it's distorting. No human being can like, first of all, has ever been trained to have that much power or, you know, they just get thrown into these places. They have egos, they have PTSD, you know, like right away, it, it's distorting. Um, I would say even to be a senator in the United States is distorting. So imagine- There's no training, like you said, there's no preparation, there's PTSD no. from previous, 
life experiences that they've had and the the, yeah. the ego rising with power can again there's just it's there's no training ugly. and then the checks come across the table from lobbyists yeah. and then so the fact through. that we think we live in a democracy i mean when four trillion dollars are spent on elections and you have homeless people in the streets that's crazy because you're trying to buy power when we know the only thing that really changes things is agitation from the streets. And so we just live in these dreamlike settings that we pretend everything's okay. And especially in the US, we, like, we get to pretend everything's okay while everybody else on the planet is paying a heavy price. And many people in the United States are paying a heavy price. When, when, you know, just look at the Paradise Fire. You know, how many people, or the shutdown. Let's just look at the budget shutdown. How many people live one paycheck away from homelessness? Yeah, I or think not it's being around 50% yeah. can't afford a $500. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty scary. Including us. <laughs> Pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in the meantime, you know, we have people with a hundred billion dollars but we let that happen i mean i don't want to like that's a form of that's we are effectively affecting genocide in say afghanistan and iraq when you think of how many people have been killed that's percentage of a population and we're affecting slavery but we just legalized them but our behavior is a behavior we should be ashamed of. But we're, we don't, it doesn't get presented that way. It gets presented on a platter of people being celebrated because they're billionaires. And that's the cool thing. Instead of, no, that is not cool. Ron, you have some thoughts? <laughs> I just, I just um, it all, it's all internal. Like, there's nothing that, that we can do externally. I mean, people need to listen to what you're saying and just make those adjustments inside. No. People like violence. People like having power. People want to be billionaires. People want to own their own jet airplane. And that's, that's half the problem. It, you know, it's just... What, we, what is among us is just a reflection of who we are. Sure, there's lots of beautiful, loving people that understand the problems that are created with uh, just being ridiculous. However, you know, they, they need to uh, pay the consequences of that and make that change. People are comfortable here in the United States, and that's the problem. Not that many are comfortable, though. That's the we're, but we're, we need more. The lens we're looking through is a very narrow lens. Yes, it is. That very few people are going to be able to experience. So yeah, most let's just go struggle. back so, to the. And you, when you struggle, <laughs> you don't have the ability to seek knowledge. Yeah. And then inform yourself That's further part of the about game. democracy. It's, let's just Correct. keep them all. Yeah. I mean, I was in. Um, in Iraq right after we invaded and I was in Bremer's he took over Saddam's palace and I was in his office which was the office of Saddam so the whole kind of like the irony of all of that was not lost on me but his intelligence officer said keep a dog hungry and I'll follow you anywhere when I complained about the chaos they were creating and clearly what we're trying to do is create chaos so we have control and that that's no different than the war economy. It creates a certain chaos in your life that people can't get off of the hamster wheel. And that they're on the hamster wheel because they think they want the, the jet or, you know, whatever. But those things aren't nourishing, really. Ron also pointed to the inner peace being that big thing is that if we could all figure but out how to work on the meditation. That's also very imperialistic and American. And the inner reflection. You well, know, other places from around the world uh, prioritize that as their first principle. Yes, but thinking. you know how that happens? It happens in community. Yeah. But we tend to think it's like medit. Uh, I had. I'm, you know, I'm very naive yeah. often. So one Likewise. of my naive thoughts yeah. Yeah. was like, well, if we just ignorant. taught everybody <laughs> meditation, you know, at the highest level, then something good would happen. And this is like 25 years ago. Well, we blew up and our population a little bit. So quickly. let me just explain yeah. what happened. 
got meditation for everybody in Congress and 250 of the leadership of um, you know, many corporations. And then what I realized, oh, it just helped them destroy the world better. Well, let's 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 do <laughs> let's do a little um, reset on like a simulation, right? Let's re okay. let's resimulate the evolution of humanity, right? Let's say that, <laughs> cool. right? This Damn, is, yeah, this is, these are the things that we like discussing. So, <laughs> so let's say that you go from a from a span of let's say a hundred million people that are all the seeds have been watered with meditation, with kindness, compassion, sharing, abundance across the planet. Then the population grows to two hundred million and continues to teach the children that over time that's how to keep this abundant mentality so it's it's like we're trying to come in and slap the peace self-work band-aid on top of an eight billion civilization that has too much greed and gluttony to put a band-aid over there needs to be a, but i, I want to actually ask you this because you pointed out jody you said that one of you said the only way was through the activism on the streets um, in terms of the kind of like the, having social change happen yeah, the that way. the people in power is, react to the people in the streets. Is there no way to Why do you think also have like a top-down influence at the same time as a bottom-up influence of making change? Like putting... Because I don't think having, the top can know what yeah, change is Yeah, and why are, you looking to, why are you looking to be led, Alan? You know, <laughs> why, do you, why do you want to be governed? It's, why can't you evolve where you're a mature human being where you don't necessarily need that? Okay, well, let's Definitely, let's, definitely let's, not what I let's said. Let's back actually way, let's way, take it. Way. Let's take let's, what. So let's back let's way take up. the most instead of straw manning and taking the worst possible scenario of being led in a horrible gluttonous way. Let's take a very positive mentality of it, a positive example of it, the best case steel man scenario of where you have people in both scenarios in a in a ground state of social activism working for change as well as in a top state where you have a lot of greed and gluttony happening but you have certain people that are positioned in positions of power that are slowly starting to e ooze their uh, desire into the others that are in positions of power about helping augment this change happening. I personally think that some people um, like Mark Benioff is aiming to make a good amount of change right now. Um, you know, one could argue that um, the Dalai Lama has a good amount of, of, of power and is making good change right now. Um, one could argue that uh, Elon Musk is doing similar work as well. So um, you are doing similar work. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think that having power uh, or influence is is uh, it makes it uh, from a top down position makes it in enable to affect other people in um, powerful positions to help the uprising occur. Well, we'll just have to agree to disagree. Okay, you think it's solely from bottom. Up. If it's gonna work, it's solely from bottom up. Well, because yeah. Because how do you yeah. know? Um, the arrogance. It works at kind of the same time. Of, but, okay. Yeah, certainly, because that's the way it works, but it works bottom up first, because to know what's needed has to come from where need is. And what you have, especially in, <laughs> in the Bay Area with all its high tech, you know, billionaires, is this sense that they know, but they don't know. They're about as disconnected as you can get, and in a way have helped create the situation and the problems. And we wanna believe that it can be easy. And I think a lot of the belief that it can be easy and a lot of the belief that it's somebody else's job and the way that we live our lives and we say, oh, well, somebody else is gonna fix that and I don't have to worry about it, has been what causes the situation where you have a lot of people with power and no one checking that power. And we, being a citizen in democracy is a big piece of democracy. Yeah. But we're informed. not informed. We're not informed. Citizen. Yeah. We don't have, you know, any more real media. The foundation of we truth. We don't is have shattered. real yeah. education. We are not taught to think critically. Um, not taught emotional intelligence. We are yeah. not taught emotional intelligence. Yeah, we are lied to from the beginning. We are, you know, so to believe in these possibilities, uh, you you have to. Ha it has to be a relationship. Those that have that are given positions of power need to be positions of responsibility. But we then 
project the power on high them. Places and then the we have lyrics up there we like. And the men who hold high places must be the ones who start. To or women. Or women. The, 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 the women. The people who hold, people who hold high the people. Yeah, yeah it's just the lyrics of a song. And the people who hold high places Don't, must be the ones who Nothing is just the, just the lyrics or just, you know, you very So mm. we 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 wanna everybody it's a it's a form of laziness. It's like they're comp we live in a really complex time. And we want somebody to know the answer because it's frightening and because we can let our anxiety be assuaged if somebody else is doing something for a while until that doesn't work and it you know, falls out in some way. Um, that helps us go along our day because if somebody really had to look starkly into the mechanism, it's not going in a good direction. Um, because you, you keep literally raping the needs of the people for this amassing of money elsewhere. Um, and, I mean, if you look at it, it's just not going to work. So we're watching, but it, it's kind of like that, you know, slow pop boiling and then all of a sudden you're dead. Um, and so we tend to, in the U.S., think there's an easy answer think we can control it, and um, think that somebody else is doing it, that there's a grown-up out there. Um, so instead, we've empowered a lot of children with a lot of power that don't have the capacities to be responsible for our needs, and um, we're crossing our fingers. So the reason I came up with the kind of idea of like growing a local peace economy was to give it a relationship to this war economy. I was like, okay, here are two things. Well, you're not attracted to being part of an abusive, oppressive, destructive thing, right? That's like not who you want to be. You want to be part of this giving, this like vibrant garden of life because a peace economy is what creates life. So, okay, we've, we've at least opened it up so you can have a relationship with it. But then the other thing is, is we live in a culture that is the war economy culture. It is those people that play that game get rewarded. And so to say, but the reward isn't the Learjet or the billion dollars. The reward is my connection to you. The reward is love. The reward is kindness and caring and rich soil and beautiful food and singing together and like all these things that literally do nourish soul and heart and and then take away that hungry ghost need for like a Learjet. So, but that's practice because your brain has been told in all these ways that this is the goal, even though you know that very few people will get there. And I think maybe being a woman makes this easier because you know, all through our childhood, the stories we were told were about princesses. Nice job if you're gonna, you know, if you can get it, but it's like not a lot of princesses out there. So early on we broke from the idea of being a princess. But in the same way, we haven't broke from the idea in this culture of being a billionaire, which is kind of the same morph. It's like, oh, you know, a hundred people are gonna be it, but there's a billion people on the planet. So what am I going to be? And why do I want to be a billionaire? Because that's super disconnected from everything meaningful and rich in the soil. But we've been taught that. So growing a local peace economy is about really getting together and being in community and learning what that is because we forgot. We forgot that you can be together and have different points of view and love each other. Um, we forgot to find out who each other is really at the depth and core of our being and fall in love and find out what we can do together. Yeah. In our local peace economy gatherings, we go around the room and we talk about what the issues are and we find out like we have a lot of concern but we're not really engaged in it. We can collectivism or give money, but when was the last time we actually deeply got engaged in it? So I'll, I'll tell you a couple stories. So in my community in Venice, like, okay, where's the local piece, where's the war economy really affecting people in our community? Well, guess what? There's 1,500, this was at the time, there's now 2,500. There's 1,500 homeless kids in our community, ages 15 to 25. 
So what can we start to do for them? Well, we started to feed them out of the trunks of our car and at the beach and then got a local Baptist church to give us a Thursday where everybody could bring food and feed them and then they could bring condoms and backpacks and socks and jackets and then maybe some people could come and give them therapy and then the local clinic could come and give them medicine and then all of a sudden the woman, one of the women that was volunteering um, uh, doing the therapy ends up her husband was the investor in Snapchat. He bought the building on the corner so it's like if you start at the place of need, it build, it's like it builds and enriches and becomes. But it's like it, it, the seed had to start at the place of need. Another thing is the asylum seekers. We're all our heart. I'm like watching everybody wring their hands. Oh my God. Like, but what are you doing? And it's like, oh, I don't know what to do. How do I help? Well, like, well, let's see. They're going to be in Tijuana. Um, we live in Los Angeles. And so just put out to the small community. This is the things they say they need. My house was full. I had to take a giant truck down of everything people wanted to give because people want to give, but there's not those pathways that make it like doable because people actually have to function as functionaries to make it happen. So then it's like all these people that have been around the table come down to Tijuana. And guess what? It's hard, painful, heartbreaking work. But at the end, they were the happiest they'd been in a really, really long time. Yes, we can. Yes, our bodies hurt. Yes, we'd had no sleep. Yes, at, you know, we couldn't figure out where, uh, you know, how things had to happen. We had to figure out in the moment and solve problems. But in the end, the connection to humanity, the stretch of our home, it's like we forgot what it is to stretch ourselves beyond what's comfortable and that that's where life is. That's where beauty is. That's where joy is. Yeah. I mean, I could tell you a hundred stories like that. Yeah. This is why we will need to continue having <laughs> these conversations when you come up to the Bay Area because there's so many good stories to unpack. And I think you're pointing at this really beautiful aspect of the peace economy, um, which is, first of all, there needs to be the peace economy option, the growth of the perspective of the peace economy across the world. Then there's this, like you were indicating, this grassroots watering the seeds of the peace economy across the pockets of communities around the world to make that bottom-up social change. And then you're also indicating from, a, from, the, from, the, from the cultural perspective of, of just what do we truly want? How, what do we want? Well, a lot of people just want opportunities they just want an equality of opportunity that they can pursue whatever they find actualizes them into the world so how do we increase so how do the they, baseline so if you want people that, around the world how are you creating it for others yeah you know it's like there's a lot of want without like if i want it how am i creating that for others that's and i right. would say that lines. that's where we lose it especially in yeah. the u.s we have this very me thing and i think it's trying to say well if i want that everybody's got to have that you know, so how am I making that happen? And it's that we, people don't get engaged because, because we have a way in an empire of thinking in grandiose notions and terms. Just pulling out of like imperialism is, isn't really a very beautiful thing. So I want to unpractice. I want to decolonize my mind. How can I become in a community so I can decolonize my mind so I even know how to be a human being I like? Um, that you know really is a human being in the sense of connecting, caring, generosity, you know, all those aspects of what we want to be friends with, right? Yeah. So, um, I want to, I want to, I want to finish the, the thought quick and then you know, pass it back over to you. So there's this, there's a simultaneous effect that I think is, is, is really crucial about the war economy to indicate, which is, it's just also repurposing of the current resource flows that we have, um, si siphoning away some of the money, um, in military endeavors. And there's really interesting ways to do things like apply artificial intelligence to the way that we um, manage a lot of the of the spending that occurs in the military to figure out how to take 10, 20, 30 plus billion dollars out of the 800 billion and put it towards education and a bunch of other fields that, that can use um, its assistance. Simultaneously, it's about what we indicated earlier, I want to just make sure to touch on this again, that if we are to press this reset simulation and we're able to rethink the way that we mold 
give nutrients to the seeds uh, of the minds that are being born into the world. I think there is a way to get to a peace economy, bypassing a war economy completely on the planet. So we did just rock it up in terms of population and exponential technology and bopping people over the head and we had to learn these lessons in many ways the hard way. Um, or would you say that you're optimistic in the long run for being able to figure out how to all play on Playground Earth? Well, I don't believe that that's my job. I mean, that's all of our jobs. and. I'm optimistic because my day is full of people who are committed to nurturing and supporting the more beautiful world that is possible. Um, yeah. Whether that happens is, you know, up for grabs. It's like how many people are going to jump on that and how many people are going to go off the cliff. I, I don't know. I just, you know, there's the present and yeah. I, I work on <laughs> being in relationship and nurturing and supporting all those that really are interested in a more beautiful future. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to achieve the peace economy transition and uh, starting from this grassroots level of sincere self-work, of, of helping in my local communities, and then just catalyzing that unity uh, mindset across the planet is so so crucial simultaneously i want to address just the sheer you know you've been going on these citizen diplomacy missions so you know them you know you know them right you know right it's right in your hand plus on you know on on code pink you can find the links in the bio you can find all of the different missions that you guys are working on and when you look at it it's kind of crazy because what's going on in venezuela is kind of crazy what's going on and we again this is when i was kind when of when you say crazy what do you mean well i'm kind of i'm kind of, well when you look it's at the map normal. when I, it's well not, you're I mean, it's well, kind of normal i i hope i hope we i hope we change through our efforts okay. and through <laughs> humanity's consciousness kind of normal awareness. capitalism killing socialism it happens all the time it's we've probably the us has caused taken the lives of 20 million people who wanted equality. There's something, there's something very important about, about providing people an equality of opportunity to pursue what they want in the world, but right. then there's also something strange about like a forced like equality of putting like 50% of men into the nursing position. Like, I guess, you know what I mean? Uh, so, so there's like this equality of opportunity for people to pursue nursing from around the world, but like, however, the genders and different people from around the world end up stacking into that um, is just based on their own desires, in a sense. Okay, but back to the central principle of what I wanted to, to talk about on Vene if somebody Venezuela. Has nothing. Plus, you go ahead. Their desires don't get fulfilled anyway, and yeah, our lifestyle and we forces that. that. So yes. Yes, that's the war so economy lifestyle. So for someone, you know, like the Chavistas in Venezuela, who have basically said, this is a fight we are not going to back down on because we believe that we deserve to have this life. We are not going back to being slaves to the machine. And the fact that the U.S. is thinking of putting Elliot Abrams in charge of Venezuela is a level of violence my brain actually can't grok. But the support maps show that the United States and Europe and South America support the newly elected... Um, the fascists, basically. So we're going to back the fascists. Well, I don't... When we, I don't, when we I don't, like, uh, had a World yeah. War II that we're so proud of. Well, because we stopped the this fascists. Is, this is the complication because then China There's not, nothing and Russia and the about Middle it. East support nothing the incumbent. Nothing complicated about it. Oh, this is extremely complicated. Why? And what's going on in Venezuela is just as complicated as what's happening at the Gaza Strip. It's just as complicated oh, as what's why? happening in You have to be so confrontational with our guests. <laughs> no, this is great. This is a conversation. <laughs> this is, this is this so is nice. This is awesome. You are... You are, you are <laughs> I'm serious. You are such a pleasure. This is, you, you know, this pleasure. is it. It's There's, like we, it we believe these stories that it's complicated. But there's nothing complicated about the fact that Israel has its foot on the throat of Gaza and tries to crush it every day. There is nothing complicated about the fact that the U.S. has their foot on Cuba, on Venezuela. You know, like, 
you know, in, it uh, caused a coup in Honduras, a coup in Brazil, um, who, you know, like whatever else is underneath that they committed to, like, we're going to raise the power of the fascists in Latin America so we can take on Venezuela. Anybody that goes against U.S. imperialism gets their teeth kicked in. Now, none of them are perfect. No, anybody who runs a com country, we already said, that's a pretty, you know, crazy, you've already gone mad. So, but do we think about the people? Do we think about what we did in Afghanistan when we bombed Afghanistan after the Taliban had said they would take us and give us Osama bin Laden? Or when did, we first came to the United States and pushed the Native yes, Americans and we're continuing. The that's it's why I was using genocide and yes, slavery. Yes, yes. It's like, it's just another form of genocide and slavery that's been made legal, but it's still immoral. Yeah, the imperialist perspective that you have is an extremely important perspective to help people realize that that has been happening now across the world for a very long time is bopping people over the head or putting coups in, however you're doing it. Um, at the same time... A coup has I, never worked. I, 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 I want I want to say I want to I want to say <laughs> why something do we that believe a coup is going to work when it has never worked? It is only part of fascism. There's there's got to be some sort of a grassroots, like we said, <laughs> divine realization of our fullest collective unity on the planet. Okay, this are, that's one time. thing I don't actually and, believe in. <laughs> collective divine realization. I actually don't believe in that. That that like I, we all evolved here on Earth. Uh -huh. A hundred billion humans yeah. built the civilization that we but live we in before us. But we taught each other. We learned about what it is to live, and we taught each other. If you look at indigenous communities and why they survived, they taught each other. Look, I've been in Mauritania. It's a country of nomads, and I was there when. Where my, is that? Mauritania. Yeah. It's the country between Senegal and. Um, oh. Morocco. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. it's an amazing country. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So yes. um, I went out with one of the nomad communities. In West I, African coast. Yes. I, my son was like eight, and so I got really connected to this one of these kids that was eight. They're and, all nomads. Yeah. D they all like just don't have a, a yeah. settled yeah. home. Yeah, right. They're nomads. And so I went out with them. And a storm was coming, and the sheep got sick, and another tribe was coming, and this eight-year-old knew how to save the sheep's life, how to protect himself when the wind was coming, and who was who, who the, the neighboring person coming. And there were, I think, 97 different tribes, and he knew all the markings and all the relationships at eight. And I thought, my son will never, in his entire life, know how to take care of himself like this eight-year-old. Um, when it became time for um, you know junior year, year abroad, I sent him to like a school in the highest place in the U.S. Not abroad, but how to learn how to survive, like how to really learn what leadership was. Was that I can take care of my tribe, and that's what he learned, um, because we don't learn, as most indigenous cultures know, how to take care of each other. That is a learned thing. That is what a parent does. That's what a tribal leader does. That's the part of responsibility we're not taking care of each other with. Because if we did, like my experience in Iran, they know what it is to get to peace. Um, if you're in Rwanda, Rwanda, everyone in Rwanda knows the seven steps to genocide. Um, when you've been close to that level of violence, there's a hubris and a, and a narcissism in the U.S. because it hasn't had to deal with the effects of our own abuse on the rest of the world. But let's just say a lot of the people in the rest of the world know what that looks like. And they, it's really fascinating. I think the most fascinating thing in Iran was to watch how I went to see the effects of sanctions. You know what I realized is we as human beings are fucking smart. And when people are controlling us, we know how to get around it, right? It's the same at the war, you know, the, the um, drug war, the war I was trying to end before I could pink. It, you know, these control systems, these controls, yeah. they don't work. We find ways around them, but they become violent, right? If we just let, you know, if we didn't have to control, which is all about money and all about greed and all about like our way and not realizing what has to happen, um, then it just becomes ugly. And, but 
I'm in Iran watching everybody get around the sanctions, taking care of each other. I didn't see a homeless person. I come back to the United States. I'm in the tenderloin yeah. crying for 25 minutes. Yeah. Crying. Yeah. Yeah, these are very, very important stories. Okay, um, just a, a quick, a quick thought. I mean, you guys are doing. Uh, you're you're aiming for more people to be aware of what's happening in in Saudi Arabia as well. Oh yeah, and we've launched a boycott. A boycott. So the, here's this here's this idea that the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, um, we CIA says, killed. Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist. Then we see that the treatment of women, the treatment of so many people that are just um, homosexual, etc., just completely horrible. And slavery. It's, it's sla Legalized slavery. And the, what, what's happening to Yemen as well, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, the so, fact that we didn't yeah. care that we had killed 100,000 people in Yemen with our bombs through Saudi Arabia. It's, but we did care that an ex-CIA operative got cut up into pieces is kind of interesting. Correct, yeah. So whatever's happening with the drones making bombs is less so in the news. That's right, yes. Or what we do to yes. people in Gaza every day. Yes. So, so, so here's here's the nuance that I'm so interested to hear. And I mean, we have, we're wrapping here. Just the thought of the thought of that complexity, and the thought of like a Bashar al-Assad in Syria of taking and just killing dissidents and not wanting to remove themselves from power. This is a complex thing. So when we talk about kind of this like imperialistic boot of like the U.S. or let's say China or Russia or whatever nation it may be. At times, I'm curious if the boot didn't come in, could there potentially be a, a a dictator that comes in and wipes out tens of millions of people and wants to pursue power? Anyway, that's a simulation that I just run in my mind, and I'm not quite sure what exactly the right um, answers are. But I'm so fascinated with the fact that you pursue for 47 years activism and peace and justice, and you've been doing it with Code Pink now for 16 years. And I, I'm just fascinated by your stories, by going to these places in the world, coming back with these stories about how to inspire community, inspire compassion, inspire the peace economy. Um, Jody, this is such, such a pleasure. Um, quickly, quick question on the way out. What is the most beautiful thing in the world? Well, right now you. Another human being dedicated to making the world a more beautiful place. <laughs> you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very inspirational. Thank you. I, I, I hope I hope we have more of these discourses as you come up to the Bay Area and join us, and we can unpack this in more detail. And we'd love to get Medea on the show too. Yeah, yeah we'd love to have Medea okay. on I the show. Good well. word Let's, for us. Yeah, we'll Let's, make that happen when Thank when you. she's around. You know, <laughs> and, you know, you come here enough to 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 make it happen. When she comes, her. yeah. Yeah, well, it's, you, you're up here enough to, to make this happen um, more. We'll talk about that soon. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on what we talked about. Inspire ourselves to have these conversations in our communities more. More love, more compassion, more community social activism. Get going. Get loving. Get building together. Get creating. We love you so much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Check out the links below to Code Pink. Follow Jody on Twitter as well. The links below. Thank you, Ron, for producing and directing. We love you very much. Everyone, build the future. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Support them. Go build. We love you so much. Peace out, everyone. <laughs>